Now, uh, can you tell me what's happened here today? Uh, we're here at the moment to commemorate the anniversary of the death of Countess Markovic, uh, 90th anniversary today. Um, uh, a wonderful woman um, who sacrificed everything for the cause of Irish freedom. And we're the 1916 Relatives Association. Tomic Balha, Tomic Balha and Jola Kamora, no Kublini Yenever, Constance de Markovic, Toshainta Gwilda Dini Chakta Quilla, Charles de Dunantir, August Todini Xmina Varing, O Quilla Kiar, Dundao and Freshen, Noka Kamora, Noka Blin, Ervos, Constance de Markovic, Tomic and Chuck in the Republican plot here in Glasnevin on the 90th anniversary of the death of Constance de Marvin. And people have come from all over Ireland and there's people from all over the world with us today in the spirit. And we're standing here in the Republican plot and we're very proud and honoured to be here at this place today. Okay. We are conscious too as we gather of those friends and relatives of our association who could not be with us today, but who have sent us their good wishes from around the world from Ireland to the USA, Germany, Britain and Australia. As we begin, let us recollect where we are gathered. We are standing as the relatives and descendants of the men and women of 1916 on holy ground. We stand among the graves and final resting places of many of our patriotic dead, among the many heroic men and women who gave their lives in the cause of Irish freedom. We stand among the dead generations from which we receive our nationhood. We stand on ground which many of our own ancestors stood upon as they gathered in, in solidarity at funerals such as O'Donovan Ross's. We stand on ground which Demarcus Vick herself stood upon as she paid her respects to her brave comrades. We stand on ground where 300,000 Irish people gathered some 90 years ago on this day, July the 15th, 1927, to pay respects to this noble-hearted, heroic Irish woman. Let us remind ourselves of this woman let us pay our respects to this ban uasal, ban ernach, ban leach, ban le mishnach, ban le fis, ban le fish, ban le fein of flahulacht. Let us remember this heroic woman who broke the mould, paving the way for greater freedoms for Irish women and men. Freedoms and liberties which are expressed so well in our proclamation and which we are still struggling to bring about in our time. Born in 1868 post-famine Ireland to a wealthy Church of Ireland ascendancy landowning family, the Gorboots of Sligo, we remember the woman who opened our heart and mind and wealth, generously embracing and dis the dispossessed of our home county Sligo and later the poor and impoverished of Dublin. The 300,000 people who gathered here mourning her passing 90 years ago were described then as the ordinary working people of Ireland. Among them, my own grandfather, Theo Shocknessy, and James's walk, the Liberties. We remember the woman who herself experienced marginality, imprisonment, deprivation, and finally poverty because of her own brave choices in the pursuit of social justice. We remember the woman who first joined Inyana Heron and later, inspired by James Connolly, the Irish Citizen Army and who bravely fought with the women of Common Amman, asserting their right to take up arms alongside men in the cause of Irish freedom. We remember the woman who challenged the existing political structures and who broke the mould in being the first elected female MP to Westminster and subsequently the first female TD to the Dáil Éireann, becoming Minister for Labour. We remember the woman who had the vision and wisdom to know that the youth of Ireland must be at the heart of the new republic, founding Fianna Éireann along with Bulmer Hobson and growing it with Con Colbert, thereby promoting a healthy patriotism and a pride in the Gaelic culture and language which in the 18th and 19th centuries had been decimated. As Pierce famously said, if Nafiana had not been founded in 1909, there would have been no volunteers in 1913. Demarkovic's work lay at the heart of the rising and movement for Irish independence. Many of us here have relatives who were in Fianna Éireann and went on to be volunteers. We come today as relatives of 1916 men and women not to dwell in the past. We come to remind ourselves of the heroic footsteps we walk in. As we return, we remind ourselves that we are called in our time to create and build a better Ireland, a more equal Ireland, a united Ireland to build a better republic addressing those deprivations which Demarkovic herself addressed and dismantling those structural barriers to women's equality and participation in power in particular, 
which she successfully challenged. We remind ourselves here today that we can be co-creators of a republic which Demarkovic herself would be proud of and which these boys and girls here may be proud of. As Eamon de Valera said, standing here 90 years ago today, Madame de Markovic is a friend of the toiler, lover of the poor, soldier of Ireland. Ease and station she put aside and took the hard way of service. We knew the friendliness, the great woman's heart of her, the great Irish soul of her. We pray that all she longed and worked for may one day be achieved. We pray that prayer again today as we remember Constance de Markovic. May all she longed for be achieved. I now introduce to you Dr. Marv McCurtain, not far, far off her 90th year herself, and a relation, a cousin of Tomás McCurtain. The pursuit of justice and truth runs strongly in her veins. She is a woman herself in the footsteps of Demarcovic who has bravely broken the mould of male history, establishing women's history in Ireland forever and integrating her story. She is a woman who has been a fine mentor to many of us history students, not alone intellectually but as a wise and kind friend. She is now going to share some thoughts on Constance Demarcovic with us. our celebrated president's wife and a wonderful leader for us. I was on a Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting me to speak at this memorable 90th birthday commemoration of Markovitz's death, actually, a wonderful event in 1927. In an address to the students of the National University at that time, in 1909, Markovitz, with remarkable prescience, this is 1909, said, there are three great movements going on. And, you know, and she really, she was talking about 1913 because they had moved on from 1909. She said the nationalists, the women's, and the labour movement. Extraordinary prophetic words, because that is really what moved and what gave energy to the 1916 rising and to the beginnings of the Free State. In that address, 1909, she said, and I think it's so true today, the greatest gifts that the young women of Ireland can bring into public life with them are ideals and principles. Ideals that are but the glint of vision that will show their, them their nation's generous face and principles that will give them the courage and strength the patient toil of the worker. She was so faithful to the working woman and the working man. The patient toil of the worker and the brilliant inspiration of the leader. And certainly in the last 30 years, we have seen that brilliant inspiration in many of our women political leaders, including the people here present. So it's wonderful to commemorate and to look back on Markovitz at this special place. It's poignant as well, because as a historian, I feel that Markovitz, she, she has eight very good biographies written about her, but most of them by foreigners. The last one I was uh, examining for her um, doctoral thesis was a Finnish woman, wonderful thesis. But it's remarkable that somehow she has been hidden from Irish history. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, what was that about? Was it because in a kind of inverted snobbery we felt that she was one of the landed classes and therefore there was something alien about her? Was it because she was a, an extremely good Marxist woman? You know, she was a, a woman of the ascendancy, she rode a horse, uh, she hunted and she had that extreme good marksmanship which was unfairly described. You know, when she was second in command to Michael Mallon in Stephen's Green as a um, you know, a woman who, who loved to shoot. That was so unfair. 
she actually should be an icon of the, um, of the Irish Army. And secondly, we have to remember that she was second in command in 1916, and she was sentenced to death. And again, there were catty remarks, unfair remarks, not just by women, they were actually by men, at her trial, you know, that she wept and that she begged not to be shot. That's nonsense. She wasn't that kind of a woman at all. And there's no evidence that kind of gossip went. Just pure and <laughs> gossip. She became president of Kamenamon at a very important time in Sinn Féin elections. And she was elected. First woman to be elected to the British Parliament. And of course, I mean, because of the times that were in it, 1918, she, she was elected as um, Sinn Féin, a nationalist candidate. She did not take her place. And again, she was a, a Minister for Labour, the first woman Minister for Labour. And unfortunately, her death cut, cut off the kind of work she would have done uh, during the middle decades, decades of the 20th century, when the Labour Party, which had been so strong coming into the um, Doyle in 1923, I think, you know, seemed to kind of have a precarious existence between the two main nationalist parties. So I, that's a speculation. Would she, as Minister for Labour, have brought the Labour Party along with her? And finally, she had the, uh, um, you know, she had the poignancy of being poor. She died poor, and she died in a public ward. You know, thousands turned out to greet her, but she was actually, you know, one of these people who made the transition very bravely, very, very courageously, very skillfully from being a member of a privileged position, you know, landowners, to being one of the poor of Dublin. And I think too, we should stay, because I noticed it last year, she should be claimed by us all as one of the most prominent military leaders in 1916 rebellion. Yes, she was second in command to Michael Mallon in college, in, college in, um, in Stevens Green, but it was much more than that. She was one of the leaders of 1916. She could have been shot, but the British knew there would be an outcry if a woman was executed for a political event such as the rebellion of 1916. The price of a public voice for men, but particularly for women, is very high. And Markovitz, I'd love to have, I'd, I'd love to have heard her voice. What kind of a voice had she? Did it carry? was it full of emotion overtones. She was a tall woman. And again, Lady Gregory, rather unfairly, you know, um, talks about her in her memoirs, you know, and doesn't talk about her at all as the kind of country woman who made the extraordinary contribution that she made. So <laughs> it's also very interesting that her own mother regarded her as a traitor to her caste and, and to her um, place in the landowning situation. Her mother never reconciled to Markovitz, so that was very difficult. So there's the private Markovitz, and then there's a very public Markovitz, who was a very humble woman. And I am waiting for a gifted Irish historian to write about our beloved Constance Scorbooth, Constance Markovitz. Good Markovitz. Because if we remember the flag of the Fianna, Fianna Aaron is the sunburst, the rising sun, which unfortunately is, is in a museum in Britain and was lent to us last year during 2016, but we would love to have it back, wouldn't we, here in Ireland, in the long term where it belongs. Please God, relations that will happen at some stage. So just to remind ourselves of the sunburst and Fáinne Gaunle, the dawning of the day. We turn now to... Eva Gord Booth, Constance's sister's words, her poignant words for her beloved sister, from the death of Funiver and the triumph of Maeve. Poets, utopians, bravest of the brave, Pierce and Macdonough, Plunkett, Connolly, dreamers turn fighters but to find a grave, glad for the dream's austerity to die. And my own sister, through wild hours of pain, 
whilst murderous bombs were blotting out the stars. Little I thought to see you smile again, as I did yesterday, through prison bars. O oh, bitterest sorrow of that land of tears, Utopia, Ireland of the coming time, that thy true citizens through weary years can for thy sake but make their grief sublime. Dreamers turn fighters but to find a grave. Too great for victory, too brave for war. Would you have dreamed the gentler dream of Maeve? Peace be with you and love forevermore. We pray especially today for the soul of Constance de Markovic and for her deceased relatives and friends. And we pray for all those who lie here and for all those who gathered here 90 years ago today. Who gone before us in the path of truth. A priest and shield, a priest and four, an ill and day with Dr. Shin, a priest and wear, a priest and tees, Gillian today, the Gosta Shin, O Oscar Heesh, the Weesh, the Boss, the Royal of a priest and all her in, O Vosco Creek, Nee Creek, Ak Aas, the Boris and Ross, the Raumid, a Yesh day, the Rowder, Elope, Agus, the Merry Bio, where Nam shot reached. Amen and Nero. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 